So John chapter 10, and the question I want to ask this morning in kind of a roundabout way is, have you ever been ghosted by someone? Now, some of you may be thinking, I don't even know what that word means. It's kind of a newish word. I mean, it's been around for a couple of years, I guess, but um, basically, when, when somebody ghosts you, if you get ghosted by somebody, it's usually in the context of a dating relationship. It happens in friendships also. But uh, when you're ghosted, somebody just completely cuts you out of their life, usually without even telling you about it. It's like you'll text them, and they, they won't text you back. You'll, you'll like send like 10 messages, and it's like, hello, hello, can you, are you getting this? Can you please respond? And it's like the person's just gone, like, like they just disappear. They avoid you. They never get back to you. They never talk to you again. And I was doing a little bit of research and, like, as to how people get ghosted and kind of why people get ghosted. And it's, it's kind of funny. Like, like uh, one girl said she got, she got ghosted by this guy she'd been dating for a, for a couple of months after she told a bad joke that he didn't like. <laughs> he just never talked to her again. Like he completely cut her out of his life. And there's, you can look up just the, the most idiotic of reasons as to why people cut them out of their lives. And... It's just we live in this culture where it's kind of okay if somebody makes us mad or if somebody does something that we don't like or, you know, we've got a problem with somebody that we just completely cut them out of our lives. And instead of working it out, instead of maybe getting past it, we say, nope, I'm done, you know, and we just avoid them at all costs. We ghost them. And it's just crazy. People just abandon each other when the other person doesn't meet their expectations. Now, this is a problem. This is ghosting, or it's also known as cloaking now. It's a problem for many people. There's just article after article about it and the psychological effects um, that take place when, when somebody that you loved or somebody that you cared about just completely cuts you out of their life. Apparently, it's causing people a lot of like psychological trauma. We kind of think about it like, well, that's not a big deal. Just get, get over it. But, it, but it's hurting people. And so it, it's not, the, the problem happens when, when we take what other people do to us and, and we apply it to God. And it's kind of like, well, this person, I, I did this, I, I messed up, and this person completely cut me out of their life. They don't want anything to do with me anymore. And if that's how people act, and if God created people in his image, is that how God acts? Like, does God ghost us when, 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 when we disappoint him, when we sin, when, when, when we make the wrong choice? Like, does God just completely cut us out of everything? Like, does he just ignore us? He's just up there mad, like he didn't want anything to do with us? And so that's, that's the kind of mindset that, that we want to take into camp this year is the, that question, like, does God ever ghost us? Like, can we go too far from God that, that he's just like, no, I'm done with that person. They screwed up one too many times. Like, there, there's no hope for them. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Or maybe, maybe if we feel like God has ghosted us, maybe, maybe the, the question isn't, does God ever ghost us? But maybe we flip that question around. It's like, do we ever ghost God? Like, do we ever stop the relationship with God? It's like, it's like, man, this happened in my life. God must not love me. You know, I'm not going to pray anymore. I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm not going to come to church. I'm, I'm not doing that. I think the truth of the matter, instead of God ghosting us, it's, 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 it's more us ghosting God. God's like, where'd you go? You know, I've been waiting for you. And this, this whole idea of, of God ghosting us is completely kind of antithetical to the gospel. It's, it's, it's opposite of, of what Jesus said. If you've got a Bible, John 10, we're going to be in John 10, 11 this morning. And it just goes against the very words of Jesus. He says this in John, in the first part of John 10, 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. It doesn't say that he's just a shepherd. It says that he's a good shepherd. Implying that there's this kind of difference between his shepherding, that's good, and kind of this other shepherding over here on this other side that, that's not so good. It's like we got a good shepherd and we got a bad shepherd, all right? There's a such thing 
as, as a bad shepherd, one who doesn't do his job well. And Jesus is saying he's not that. Like you take all these other shepherds in the world and you line me up against them and I'm, I'm over here and these other people are completely over here. Good shepherd, bad shepherd. And I want to talk about this morning what a good shepherd looks like. But, but first I want to talk about what a, what a good shepherd doesn't look like. I, want, I kind of want to talk about what a bad shepherd looks like. If you've ever been around a farm or anything with you know, sheep or anything else that you've kind of got to keep together as a flock, you know, a shepherd, his job is to take care of that flock, make sure they get where they're supposed to go, that they don't get hurt, that he takes care of them. I was, I was reading about this, this flock of 1,500 sheep. I think this happened in 2005, if I'm not mistaken, in Turkey. And there's this flock of 1,500 sheep, lots of sheep, and the, uh, the shepherds decided to go have breakfast one morning and to just leave the sheep to kind of fend for themselves. And all of a sudden, one after the other, these, one sheep just jumped off the cliff and the rest of them, you know, plop, 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 plop. You know, they, they just keep following each other because sheep are not the smartest animals if you've ever been around sheep. They kind of follow the leader, even if the leader goes somewhere that, that's not the best, you know, destination. And so 1,500 sheep go off of the cliff and by the time these shepherds find them, about 450 of the sheep are dead. Because they hit the ground. But the rest of the about, you know, a thousand or so sheep, they, they survived because they landed on the other sheep and the sheep kind of cushioned the fall. It's kind of funny, but it's not funny. I mean, um, but that is a bad shepherd. When, when you leave the flock to go eat breakfast, to go do your own thing, and, you know, a lot of your flock, a third of your flock almost just dies because breakfast was too important, because you had other things to do. Bad shepherds ignore their flocks. Bad shepherds only care about a paycheck, or breakfast, or, or, or what, what, what there may be. But good shepherds do a lot for their flock. I mean, all you have to do is look at, look at David, but before he became king of, of Israel, before he, before he defeated Goliath, before, before David becomes famous, you just look at what, what it says in 1 Samuel 17. You don't have to turn there. But da uh, da David's getting ready to go fight Goliath. And he's trying to talk King Saul, the king of Israel, into letting him go because David's not the biggest guy. David doesn't look like a soldier. David's been out in the fields as a shepherd. And this is, this is what David says to kind of get Saul to, to convince him to, to let him fight Goliath. He says, in verse 34, he says, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine, talking about Goliath, shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God." And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And he lets him go fight Goliath. And we know how that story goes. He slings the stones. He kills the, the big giant. Cuts off his head. That's the best part of the story. But his, his shepherding prepared him to do that. He knew how to use a slingshot because he'd used it as a shepherd by protecting the flock. See, good shepherds don't just watch the flock. They watch out for the flock. You know, this includes watching out for predators. Like, like, like you're taking, you know, you're, you're looking at the flock and you see in the distance like wolves up there or any other kind of predators. That means watching out for them, taking care of them, having to kill those things if you need to so that they don't hurt your, hurt your flock. Watching out for robbers, things like that. And, and then when there's a threat... A good shepherd, as opposed to a bad shepherd, rises to the occasion and, and protects his flock. He does whatever it takes to, to keep his animals safe. You know, it means they, they watch out for sickness. You know, they watch out for, for danger. Like, hey, there's a cliff up here. Let's keep them away from here. Or this, 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 this lamb is sick. Let's get it away from the rest of them and get it healed. They, they care about the whole herd, but they also, or the whole flock, but they also care about the individual. You look at passages like Psalm 23, and I know we often read it at funerals, but just, just listen to this. It, it talks, 
so much about why, why we need shepherds and, and, and what God does for us. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Like I said, we often use that for funerals to talk about how God comforts us in the midst of death, and he certainly does that. But this is a great reminder of how we're all sheep, and God is our great shepherd. See, God often refers to his people leaders, like Israel's leaders in scripture. You read through the Old Testament. He often refers to them not so much as kings or priests or all that, but as shepherds, as, as people who, who guide people to where they need to go, who are supposed to oversee them and who are supposed to look out for them. He, he, he refers to them as shepherds most of the time. It's also what elders and pastors, you know, in, in Greek the word means shepherd, and you get to passages like Ezekiel chapter 34. And Ezekiel's not a very happy book. And, and you, get to, you get to this chapter, and, and God gives this prophecy uh, for Ezekiel to speak. And in, in chapter 34, he says, The word of the Lord came to me. He said, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who've been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you've not strengthened, the sick you've not healed, the injured you've not bound up, the strayed you've not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you've ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered, they wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered all over the face of the earth, with none to seek... Or search for them. He's got a lot to say to these shepherds, these bad shepherds who have been supposed to be leading his people, ruling his people, and they've not been doing a good job. They've cared more about themselves than about their flock. And so he rebukes them. But, but he goes on and he says there's going to be a day that comes where there'll be another shepherd. He's going to be just like David, and he's going to find my sheep. He's going to gather them. He's going to gather them together and protect them and lead them and rule them. He reminds them that he reminds the sheep that one day God Himself is going to come, and He's going to seek out the sheep of His pasture Himself. It's a beautiful passage. And after about six hundred years pass from Ezekiel thirty-four, we get to John chapter ten, our, our text this morning, and you get. Jesus talking about being the good shepherd. If, if you know anything about the book of John, there's, it's, it's comprised of, of seven miracles and seven I am statements. And for Jews, numerology was, was very important. And the number seven is, is the perfect number because it symbolizes completion. And so you've got, you've got Jesus here. And he's talking about being a good shepherd. And he's talking about being a, as opposed to a bad shepherd. And who are the bad shepherds in the book of John? And it seems like in the context, if you read this, bad shepherds are the religious leaders who have been taking advantage of their flock. Instead of leading them and instead of watching out for them and protecting them, they load them down with all these kind of religious burdens and all these laws and, and commands that, that they themselves couldn't even keep. And instead of building up their wounded... They, they were shooting them. And instead of pointing them to God, they were really pointing them away from him. And I think this is probably one of the reasons why when Jesus is born, when, when the Messiah is born, the angels actually appear to the, to the actual shepherds in the fields, the lowly, the despised people, instead of like the, the quote-unquote shepherds of the religious leaders. He chooses to appeal to phys appear to physical shepherds instead of the spiritual shepherds. There's, there's probably a point there. I mean, they, they knew that the, their Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem, and yet they're too lazy to go and see. 
And then Jesus grows up, and he says things that none of the religious leaders say. He does all these miracles to back up what he says, to, to validate his identity. And one of these miracles happens in John 9, right, right before Jesus says he's the good shepherd. He heals this man that's, that's, that was born blind. The religious leaders don't like it because it happened on the Sabbath. And instead of them rejoicing that this person who was born blind can actually see again and, and be happy for him that, that God had restored his sight, instead of doing that, they kicked the guy out of the synagogue. They excommunicate him because he dared to say that, man, I don't know what happened. All I know is I was born blind, but, but Jesus made me see. And they don't like that answer because they don't like Jesus. They don't really like God. And so they kick him out. And Jesus sees this happen. And these are the bad shepherds that he's talking about. They're completely acting out of character with God. These are the kind of people that God rebukes in Ezekiel 34. These are shepherds who are going to be judged by how they've shepherded. And you can't understand what Jesus says in John 10 about being the good shepherd if you don't understand what happens in John 9 with the healing of this blind guy. He's still talking to the same religious leaders who just kicked this guy out for being healed. And you get to John 10, and he says this, starting in verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not listen to them. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So Jesus intentionally sets himself aside as the good shepherd against the backdrop of these bad shepherds. And he asks, well, how's Jesus the good shepherd? How is he different than these religious leaders who are supposed to, who have, uh, supposed to have been shepherding these people? He provides what we need. He provides salvation, he provides pasture, eternal life, abundant life. And he seeks out the sheep. We read the first part of this a minute ago in Ezekiel 34. Let me, let me read the second part of this, what he says. In, in the first half, God's rebuking the shepherds. He's saying, man, you guys have blown it. My, my sheep are everywhere. Because you guys are lazy, you're more worried about yourself and, and being comfortable than you are about actually leading my people. So I'm going to scatter them everywhere. And then, and then he says this. In Ezekiel 34, verse 11, he says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out the flock when he's among the sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they've been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I'll feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. It's a beautiful passage when, when you realize what John is doing here and what Jesus is saying here. It harkens right back to Ezekiel 34, and then you get Jesus saying things like he's quoted in Luke 19.10. It says, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He came to be the shepherd that was prophesied 600 years before by Ezekiel. See, the sheep don't find the shepherd. It's not like one day the sheep are running around, it's like, oh, look, a shepherd. No, the shepherd seeks out the sheep. Like, we, we, don't, we don't save ourselves, God saves us. And he, he protects the sheep from dangers. He, he's constantly going to bat against these religious leaders, and he's reinterpreting their rules in light of his truth. He's constantly warning his disciples about the dangers of the, of the teaching of, of all these religious leaders, these bad shepherds, and he binds up the ones that they've shot. Everything that he said in Ezekiel 34, Jesus is doing it. 
But even more than that, he lays down his life for the sheep. He doesn't run away like the hired hand who doesn't care about the sheep. He makes the ultimate sacrifice for his flock. He gives his own life so that they might live. You know, this, is, this is how we know that Jesus will never ghost us. Man, he, he proved it. Like, like he, he died for us. He, he came to, to live the life we couldn't live, and he died the death that, that we should have died so, so that we might have life. And he didn't, he didn't die for us when we got everything right. It was while we were in the midst of acting stupid and dumb like sheep, all going our own way, doing our own thing, inventing ways to sin. Scripture repeatedly calls us sheep. And I don't know if you know, but that, that's not exactly a compliment. In, ca- in case you're wondering, that's for free. Um, and he, he calls us sheep for good reason. But in Romans, Paul writes this, Romans 5, he says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. So very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received reconciliation. Like, how do we know God won't ghost us? How, how do we know that we can never go too far? Man, he, he gave his life for us while we were in the midst of rebelling like sheep and jumping off cliffs and doing all kinds of things. And if we're truly in Christ, if we've got the Holy Spirit living inside of us, it's another reason you know God will never ghost you. There is nothing that we can ever do to make God ghost us. I mean, we may ghost God, but he's never going to ghost us. He's never going to abandon us because a good shepherd never abandons his flock so that he can go have breakfast or whatever. He always takes care of the flock. But there is nothing that any of us could ever do to make God just be done with us. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, it says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I don't, I don't know if, if that makes you jump for joy, but that, that excites me when I read that. Because there is absolutely nothing in this life that can take you away from the love of God. If you're truly in Christ, there is nothing that can take that away. Yeah, we're going to sin sometimes. But Jesus already dealt with that. He doesn't ghost us. When we mess up, he gives us his spirit inside of us so that we know that that he's going to finish what he started, that he's going to come back, that one day all of this is going to be redeemed and reconciled back to him. And if we feel like he's ghosted us, chances are it's probably the other way around. We've kind of stopped talking to him, kind of stopped pursuing him. but He's he's just waiting. Like the prodigal son of Luke 15, you know, Father's just waiting on the porch for his son to, to come back home, just looking and longing for him to come back. And one of the, one of the best kind of illustrations that, that I've heard, like if, if we feel like God's ghosted us or if we, if we feel like, you know, he, he, he's distant from us, man, get a couple of chairs. You sit in one, set the chair across from you, an empty chair. And as you're sitting in one chair, just visualize God sitting in the chair across from you. I just have a conversation with him. Just pray audibly, like, like you're talking to somebody who's, who's physically in front of you. He's there. You may not see him, but he's there. And just say the things that, that you found it hard to say. And I'm telling you, I've, I've read stories of people who have done this and their lives have been completely changed. We may ghost God, but God will never ghost you. Will you pray with me?